being here. It's, uh, uh, I'm the Dean of Campus, Doug Bunn, and I'm pleased to have this Swalk and Beyond presentation. We appreciate that you're here. Uh, we also thank Curry County Voices for being here to record the event. And I'd like to let you know we've got a couple of events coming up. Um, our last event of the term or of the year will be in two weeks from tonight where um, Deborah, Deborah Worth will be giving a presentation on the a healthy Chetco River. So if that's of interest to you, we'd invite you to come out. We also have the last installment of our Mushrooms uh, presentation, which will be Thursday at 2.30 in this room. And then on December 11th, we'll have another cultural potluck with the uh, idea of the holiday foods. There's flyers, of course. You were our uh, capable staff. I know I hit you up on the way in. Thank you for being here. Um, I just met Avery tonight, but when his, when the topic came up of having someone to do emergency preparedness, Avery's name was the one that kept coming up. So we're pleased that he would take the time to come out on a rainy day or evening, and uh, I'll turn the time over to him from there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Avery Horton. I'm the founding member of Southwestern Oregon Preppers. Um, I know maybe, how many people here have seen Doomsday Preppers? <laughs> right, so maybe you're expecting somebody up here in camo and face paint. Sorry to disappoint, but uh, that's, not, that's not what we're about. Um, the thing about preparedness is, is that to me, I don't do these talks because I want to go around and preach doom and gloom and make everybody afraid and scared. No, I want to help you prepare, make you aware, that way you don't have to be scared. Okay? Uh, one thing about my presentations, I like the Socratic method, so I'm going to ask questions and I expect answers, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's see. <coughs> okay, a little bit about me. Uh, my background is in computer science. I went to the University of Maryland, way over here on the East Coast. Born in Washington, D.C., but don't hold me accountable for what's going on there now. Um, I've been a survivalist slash prepper since the 1980s. Um, how I became to be a quote-unquote survivalist, a friend of mine I've known since seventh grade wrote me a letter. Um, I think it was after we got out of college. And he basically said, everything you do should have a dual purpose fun, recreation, but also there should be a preparedness, survival um, aspect to it. For example, how many people here go hunting, fishing, and camping? I so see you guys know that um, if you have a disaster, you know what that is, and you have to bug out, you know what that's called? Anybody? Unscheduled camping! <laughs> you weren't scheduled to, you know, go live in your tent, but, you know, if you have those, if you have that equipment, you're prepared. Um, I'm also CERT trained and a CERT trainer. CERT, Community Emergency Response Team. And back here we have Jeremy Dumeyer, who's our Curry County Emergency Manager, probably here to check up on me if he's going to say anything wrong. Um, also, I've taken the basic disaster life support um, course, the CTEP, which was all about the Cascadia education. So I've got all of the fun goodies and go around and teach people about earthquakes. Um, I'm a home care worker, which means I have a first aid and CPR card. Okay? So, that's a little bit about me. Uh, the, thing, the reason I mentioned um, my degree in computer sciences is I took a systems approach to analyzing disasters. Where, because I just thought something was wrong. I've been reading about things and following what's out there, but it, it just never felt right. It, did, it was like something's missing. It's like I think they've kind of missed the boat here. Um, about the organization, Southwestern Oregon Preppers, we meet all the way from Brookings up to Reedsport, and I've gone over to Grants Pass and Bedford area, Roseburg, and done presentations there too. Um, we meet monthly, and we're just like-minded people sharing ideas. How many people here consider themselves a prepper? Do I have any? Okay. Now, you probably know maybe somebody in your family or some of your friends 
you start talking about preparing it, think you wear a tinfoil hat and you're a little crazy. But when we have our meetings here amongst like-minded people, we're all crazy there, right? Um, and we just teach skills and we, we want to be self-reliant, okay? We don't want to depend on somebody else. We want to be able to take care of ourselves and our own. Okay, here's a list of events. Let everybody know about the Cascadia? Is there anybody who doesn't? Okay, um, so we know out there anywhere from 60 to 120, 50 miles, there is a fault. And at any point in time, it could slip like right now. And if it does, we're going to have an earthquake, the big one, 9.0. And following it, we will have a tsunami, right? But these are events, okay? And probably if we have an earthquake tsunami, we're going to have a power outage, right? Probably have a flood. So you can see, and probably have some mudslides too. Not to mention bridges down, roads blocked, etc. But these, in and of themselves, are just events, right? Somebody makes a sound in the woods. Is anybody here, right? So, what is a disaster? Now, if you attended my presentation, you're going to get the answer to that question, Jeremy. <laughs> so, what's a disaster? A disaster is when it happens and you're not prepared. Anybody else? A catastrophic event cuts off communications and or power and I just think of disaster can be anything you're not prepared for. Okay. That's right. A disaster is not having what you need when you need it. Does everybody agree with that definition? Okay. So, when does an event become a disaster? Something happens and there's injury and death. Disaster, right? It could be a car accident. Right? Disaster. Damage to or loss of property and life. Scarcity or shortage? <coughs> How many people ever experienced no gas at the gas station? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. How about no food at the food store? Right? Interruption of services. Anybody ever been without electricity for more than a day? Yeah. Okay. And so basically, uh, if the need is greater than the available resources, an event can become a disaster. So, I came up with what I call the disaster equation. Have an event, add to it an undesirable result, and the resources get overwhelmed, you get a disaster. Everybody agree? Mm -hmm. Pretty simple and straightforward. But most people think of an earthquake or a hurricane, that's a disaster. No, because you can have an earthquake if nothing happens to anybody, is it a disaster? Okay. So, what is preparedness? Come on. <laughs> what? Having what you need. Yeah. Anybody else? Having what you need when you need it. Okay, so why prepare? Anybody? So you don't have to have a cold shower. Okay. <laughs> Peace of mind. Peace of mind. Good one. Anybody else? Survival. Survival, right. So, if you're prepared and nothing happens, smart, right? And if you're not prepared, like most people, and nothing happens, smile. But if something happens and you're prepared, well, you're not really smiling. But you're not this guy. You don't want to be this guy. Any questions on that? Because when you look at this, it just makes sense, right? Okay, so how many people here have go bags? Okay, why is it every hand up? <laughs> why isn't every... You guys just agree with me. You don't want to be this guy, so... What's, what's holding you back? Anybody. Why, don't you, why aren't you prepared? I'm looking for a good source of uh, go bag. Okay. Anybody else? I haven't made it in that book priority. Okay. Anybody really don't know what to put in it. Don't know what to put in it? Even if you've got one, it's hard to keep it rotated so it's current. Yeah. 
Hard to keep it rotated, okay? Anybody else? Okay, now, this is where we really have to start thinking. Three objectives of disaster preparedness. Before the disaster, that's you prepare, right? Because during a disaster, there's only one thing that you need to really concern yourself with, and that's survive. That's something that a lot of people forget when a disaster happens. You're, it's just one objective, survive. Make it through, whether it's a fire, flood, hurricane, you name it. You just want to make it through, survive. So once you get on the other side of the disaster, you can recover, rebuild. Anybody uh, remember Hurricane Katrina? Yeah. You know they're still recovering, still rebuilding. How long ago was that? Yeah, it's been a while. So that's another reason why you need to prepare, because it's gonna it could take a long time. Here on the coast, if we get the big one. We're probably looking at 50 years. I probably won't be alive to see the recovery, but. Um, it's going to take a long time. Basically, the coast is toast. <laughs> so, I don't say that to scare you. Once again, be aware. You know, <coughs> you know, up and down the coast, they're doing things that if we have a Cascadia event, or rather, when we have the Cascadia event, it's not going to make it better. It's only going to make it worse. Anybody think of anything that's going on right, like that right now? My client could be a problem. The what? Sure, the coast could be a problem. Mm -hmm. Anything else? There's been a couple of earthquakes, earthquakes, off the coast mm -hmm. recently. Right. Off the development. Exactly. Where'd they build the new or the hospital in Gold Beach? <laughs> Tsunami. Okay. Don't get us started. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is one of my favorites. Disasters come in two flavors, the ones that give warning and the ones that don't. So, we're going to have a, a hurricane in three days. We have a hurricane in two days. We're going to have a hurricane in one day. We're going to have a hurricane hit, oh, about 3 p.m. If you... Make the choice to participate in that hurricane. That's on you. You have warning. You could have done something about it, as in leave the area. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. Now, the ground starts shaking, earthquake, we don't get a warning. None. Zero. Zip. No warning. See the difference? <coughs> You wake up in the morning and the power is out. Did you have a warning? No. No. Okay, how many people here know somebody that uses an oxygen concentrator? What happens when the power goes out? It stops. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a serious thing. Once again, I'm a home care worker. When we had that event over in um, Sutherland, Roseburg, back in March, Week snow where people got trapped on 38 and helped in. Sutherland, Roseburg, there was people without power for nine days. Wow. So they were on an oxygen concentrator. So I took that, you know, to the sale and said, hey, you know, we got to look at being able to help the most vulnerable population. <laughs> okay. Okay, disasters come in all sizes. Some disasters only affect you. Anybody ever lose a job? <laughs> That's kind of a disaster, because what happens when you lose your job? What stops? Money. Money. Yeah. Okay, in fact, um, one of the uh, members of SWAP, his wife worked for federal government. I guess it was back in February, when they were like two weeks, no paychecks. But he had six months of food put back. In fact, I just spoke to him on the phone, and they have, it's not really a disaster, but they had a couple unexpected bills, and they put out close to $9,000 already this month. And his 
basically his bank account's running on food, on fumes, but he's got six months of food. He's not worried. At least not worried about eating. Okay, um, you know, some disasters might only affect your neighborhood. Some idiot hits the power pole and knocks out you and your neighbor's lights. And unfortunately, sometimes these transformers aren't readily available from back order. So, you might have to wait a while to get your power restored. Okay, I live up near Bandit, um, but I'm my own water company. But Bandon has a, uh, they, the city runs a water facility there. And so they had a viewing, being a guy, I like to see heavy equipment, and, you know, machinery and stuff run. So I'm taking a tour, the guy goes, yeah, we got this pump here. And I go, do you have a backup for that pump? He's like, no. I go, well, what happens if that pump goes out? He goes, well, we have no water. And we'll go, another pump. What about that? We have, no, they have no backup. So they just have to have a bond to get more money because I think they want water. <laughs> you see, you guys are laughing, but it, this is serious business. You have to, you know, when you're... Uh, taxing districts have open houses. Mm -hmm. Go see it. Ask questions. Look. Say, well, what happens if that breaks? Oh, and find out what the answer is. Because that might spur you to, say, have extra water on hand. You know, some disasters can hit the whole state or, you know, big area of the state. Um, like a water scare, something bad in the water you can't drink it. Anybody ever been in a place where there's a, been a water scare where you can't drink it? Yeah, I was in Salem was last year that happened. Yeah, there was a fight in the uh, Costco, people fighting over water. Somebody had five gallon or five um, cases of water in their SUV. Somebody, you know, broke the window, stole their water. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's what happens, you know. And, you know, we could have a, you know, worldwide disaster like a tsunami, earthquake, corona mass, ejection, asteroid, you know, those things that have, that could happen, but low probability. Yellowstone and, could go. Hmm? Yellowstone could go. Yeah, Yellowstone could go. Um, and disasters are like dominoes. As I mentioned before, you have one disaster like an earthquake, tsunami, then usually the grid goes down, then there's some floods. So they don't just come single. Almost, you know, forest fire. Anybody here experience a fire <laughs> recently? Yeah. And, you know, it's the power lines. What happened to California recently? Why? <laughs> to prevent so. Did those people have any warning? Yeah. So, I mean, these are the type of things that can happen. There's another reason to prepare. So, where will you be when disaster strikes? There's only two places, you either at home or away. Anybody have a third option? <laughs> okay, so if you're at home or you're away from home. So, if you're at home and you get a warning, that's probably the best one. Anybody disagree? Okay, it's okay to disagree with me. You know, a healthy debate is great. Okay, <laughs> if you have a warning and you're away from home, let's say you're at work or school or on vacation, you're away from home, you get a warning. Are you prepared? Are you? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, you didn't think about it. Okay, but no warning at home. Once again, you're not happy about it, but at least you're at home. All your stuff, and hopefully uh, your family members. But if you get no warning, <laughs> Right now, away from home, if you're not prepared, you're going to be this guy again. You don't want to be this guy. So never leave home? <laughs> never leave home without it. Right? <laughs> yeah, without your bag. Okay, now, there's, once again, from a system standpoint, I realize you only need to be able to do three things. Shelter in place, some people call it bugging in staying home or wherever you are, like right here. If something were to happen and the best choice was we stay here, are we prepared to stay here? 
Depends on how many of those bags you have. And I got one. <laughs> 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 my bag. <laughs> okay, now, the, one other option is we might need to evacuate. If something happens, like all of a sudden we see flames out there, or we're here, or the ground starts shaking, we might need to beat feet out of here. So we always have to be prepared to evacuate. And if you're not home, you want to be prepared to get home, right? Because no matter where you are, so when it makes sense to go home, like after a fire, after a flood, after an earthquake, after a hurricane, sooner or later you're going to want to go to where your house is hopefully still standing. Does that make sense? So those are the only three things to be prepared to do. Because if, you, if you're prepared to do these three things, then you're prepared for any disaster, right? Because those are the only three things you're going to want to do after a disaster. Make sense? Okay. Now, common mistakes and misconceptions. Okay, this isn't about bashing the government, but there used to be a rumor, hopefully I've squashed it, that in Redmond there's these big warehouses filled with food and water and supplies. So when the earthquake comes, they'll just bring it here. It doesn't exist. Has anybody else heard that rumor? Good. Hopefully I squashed it then. Okay. Now, some people say if you're prepared for an earthquake, you are prepared for any disaster. Does anybody agree with that statement? No. Oh, you guys knew that the, the right answer. No, you're not. Because you can be prepared for an earthquake, but are you prepared for a, uh, some type of contagious outbreak, something in the air? Contagions, contaminants? Are you prepared for a terrorist attack? Are you prepared for an earthquake? No. But if you do those other three things, then you are. Okay, overdependence on gear. Okay, guys, how many of you guys have more than one knife? Keep your hands up. More than two. More than three. More than four. More than five. Yeah, you see, we, we like gear. And we call something, we call it the preparedness industry because every day in my inbox, my email account, Bob Pierce wants to sell me a knife. I'm not kidding. Almost every day, there's this new knife I have to have, and if I don't have it, I'm going to die. You know? Or, they're going to sell me a flashlight that's just you know, bigger and better than the one before. Because if I don't have that flashlight, I'm going to die. And then they're going to try and sell you a fire starter. Then they're going to sell you, you know, freeze-dried food. Then it's just constant advertisement barrage. You know why? Anybody know why that's happening? Funny. Well, that's part of it, yeah. Okay, anybody here at Y2K? Yeah, okay, before Y2K, a gentleman named Kurt Saxon coined the term survivalist. But when you think of survivalists, you think of some bad, scary people, right? The face paint, coming, jumping out of bunkers, with automatic weapons, shooting at anything that moves. I mean, they show those kind of people on doomsday preppers. But that's not what this is about. But you see, Y2K, they were selling people generators and, and tents and all this other equipment. But Y2K came, nothing really bad happened, right? Well, then there's all these warehouses filled with this stuff that they had to offload and sell. So I guess they had, they called a meeting somewhere. They didn't invite me. But they said, we got to come up with a new name. Because if you name it, you can sell to <coughs> Preppers! You know what? That sounds kind of nice. You know, a soccer mom could be a prepper. So that's how preppers, that, that term came to be, in my opinion. I don't know for sure, but that's just my thoughts on it, because now, you got the doomsday preppers and you got the advertisements and on and on and on. I mean, you got stores selling survival gear. But once again, what is, like, when you survive after disaster, what's that called? Resilience. Remember, there was a term, un, unscheduled camping. Right? Because you see, if you go to your local big box store, 
And you go in the sporting goods section, probably they have an uh, area, once again, where they have the knives. I bet you, you can find a fluorescent <coughs> orange zombie killer or a fluorescent green zombie killer. I see them at Walmart all the time. Anybody else see those? What? You haven't seen those fluorescent orange knives or anything? Like the Bear Gorillas, you know, or um, Cody Lundin. He's all these guys, you know, on the um, disaster shows you can watch on TV. They're all trying to sell you stuff. They books, and then come take this um, survival skills um, seminar or weekend. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to show you a couple of videos since we got popcorn. We might as well take advantage, right? Anybody see footage of Fukushima over in Japan? Did you see anybody out there camping, fishing with a little up they got out of an Altoids can? Did you see any of that? Did you see anybody, you know, um, building campfires and batoning, you know, batoning their knives or any of that? How about what the hurricane that happened in Puerto Rico? Was it Maria? Yeah. Anybody see any of that footage? Did you see anybody there doing any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. You know, wilderness survival has, there's an overlap between that and natural disaster survival, okay? But the thing is, is that, once again, it's the guys they appeal to that, our inner Rambo, which is really a, the inner Rambozo. Because if you try any of that Rambo stuff, you're going to look like a clown and probably hurt or kill yourself. And you guys are laughing only because it's true, right? I mean, really, how many of us guys in here are in that great a shape we can climb a tree, you know, fashion our knife to a spear, jump down, kill a boar, and, you know, carry a quarter of. No. <laughs> Jeremy, can you do that? Oh, thanks. See? <laughs> So the point is, is that you know, overdependence on gear and all that stuff, they're just trying to sell it to you. Chances are everybody in this room at home has just about everything you need to survive. You just don't have it organized in one place. The one, the one thing you might not have is a water filter. How many people have a water filter? Oh, good. I'm almost preaching in to the choir. Right? I do. Hmm? In my fridge, I do. Yeah, but you, you couldn't purify water at the creek. No. Right. So that's what I'm talking about. Um, so that's about the only gear you need, and you can buy, okay, disclaimer, I do not own stock in Sawyer. I don't own any part of the company, and they don't pay me. But you can go to uh, probably Fred Meyer, Bymark, Walmart, Amazon, eBay, and you can find a water filter from Sawyer for about $19.99, 20 bucks, that will filter up to 100,000 gallons of water. How many gallons of water do they say you need per day? Yeah. How many? Two. Two. So if you can do 100,000, that's 50,000 a day. Is anybody want to tell me how long that is? Yeah. So for 20 bucks, you pretty much have water covered. You just have to make sure you and the water filter are within proximity of each other when a disaster happens. How do you spell that brand? S A W Y E R. I've got one here. Yes, yeah, Sawyer. Like Tom Sawyer. And it was yeah. clean creek water? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. The only thing it won't clean is if there's some type of chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody tries to poison it, it won't get right. that out. But all that guard, guardia, giardia, yeah, and the, uh, what's the other one? The C. <coughs> um, all that kind of stuff. It will filter. Now. Is that like in the camping? Yeah. Yeah. Now, we anybody? Water, though. Yeah, okay, anybody, you don't get to say. If you see me before, don't answer. Do you guys have any idea why I'm playing with this yo-yo? No. No. <laughs> you have to have something to do to keep your mind busy while you're uh, <laughs> um, camping. No. no. You see here, it's, it's because of this. The government's going to come to help. How long did it take the government to get to Katrina? Uh, way too long. How long did it take wait. the government to get to... Um, the people in Puerto Rico. Yeah. So the thing is, yo yo, you're on your own. Y O Y O. See, if you don't, if you only remember one thing, you remember there's some guy up there playing with a yo yo. Oh yeah, you're on your own. That's why you have to prepare. 
Curry County population, 22,000, give or take. Coos County population, 62,000, give or take. Anybody know what the population of Eugene is? About 150,000. How about Portland? Yeah. Now, FEMA puts out this book where you can call them up and they'll send you a copy, the Are You Ready book. And sir, we have a mantra, something that we go by. Listen carefully. The greatest good and the greatest number. Everybody repeat after me. The greatest good for the greatest number. Now. We're going to port. Exactly. So, <laughs> if we have the big one or anything close to, anything like a big one, where are they going to send the resources first? The Curry County, of course. No. And just like, like with the fire, with the bar fire, they were all about protecting brookings, not the places farther out. And as it got closer, they were going to like let things go until they got to town. Mm -hmm. That was not the last thing they were going to let go. Right. So, let's see. In here, I do believe I've got the business cards from the FEMA Region 10 director, the Oregon, his name's Mike, and the Oregon emergency manager, his name's Andrew, and Jeremy can back me up on this. We've been to the Oregon Preparedness um, Expo held over in the Bend area the past two years, and I always tell these guys, you've got to come down to the coast. Every time. They go, well, invite me. They go, I have invited you. And you get my emails. Then you get my phone calls. You still haven't been here. What's that tell you? Yeah. It's not that they're bad guys. <laughs> but once again, what did you guys have to say? The greatest yeah. good is the greatest number. Yeah. Okay. Priorities. Exactly. So any questions on anything I've said so far? We've gone about half an hour. Feel free to stop me and ask questions because I ask you guys questions, right? You yeah, so haven't talked about climate change on your list of things that could happen. Well, that's kind of uh, debatable. But the thing is, we're talking about disasters. Climate change would cause some of those disasters, okay? And climate change could cause something like crop failure. Anybody hear about the crops, this year's crop? A lot of crops they couldn't even plant. Exactly. I, I know. So what do you think the food supply is going to look like next year? Expensive. Yeah. Well, expensive. Like, why? Like cattle that die. Short, short, short. Okay. Because what was it? A bunch of, uh, was it pigs over there in the, where it was flooded? They couldn't get them out. So price of bacon. So that's just something that, you know, just when you hear these news events, if you think in terms of preparedness, you're going to go. Um, oh, well, this disaster could cause this to um, have a shortage, so I better stock up now while I still can. Because I remember when Katrina hit, you know what I did? I immediately drove my truck to the gas station and filled up because I knew what was going to happen to gas prices. Okay, anybody hear the rule of three? Okay, this is more about how I built my um, bug out bag, get home bag. Okay, roll it three. Everybody know what dead means? No. Yeah. <laughs> Not in your terms. I know what being dead means. Exactly. That's what dead is. <laughs> it's no sign act or no. Dead is dead, right? We all understand that. When we do the um, CERT training, we always say dead because we. If you have to tell somebody. Some, one of their loved ones is dead, you don't want to say things that they might not understand. But everybody understands dead, right? Yeah. Okay, so three seconds, roll it three, three seconds. <coughs> you make a bad decision, if you hesitate, or if you freeze, you could be dead. dead. Right. <laughs> so, if you're not paying attention, when in traffic you look at the cell phone, dead be dead. Yeah. So, you have to keep your wits about you because it can happen just like that. You know, if you see something and you freeze, as opposed to getting out of the way, dead. Three minutes without oxygen, you are dead. dead. Right, so, smoke inhalation, right? Can't breathe, no oxygen, dead. 
So you want to have something that can protect you. Now, when most people talk about survival and what they need to prepare, you always hear them talk about food and water. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Now, in the past year, how many people that have you heard about dying because they didn't have enough food? They died of starvation. Very few. Any? Have you? Any? No. No. Has, has anybody heard of anybody dying of starvation? Ever. In this? Because of the disaster? No, no. Just, just in, in general. Overseas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, has anybody heard of anybody dying because they didn't have any water? Yes. Yeah. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? And the reason I ask that is, three hours, if your body core temperature varies from 98.6 by plus or minus 5 degrees, you are, okay, Pacific Ocean, average temperature, 56 degrees. You fall overboard, that water starts sucking all the heat out of your body. That's it lasts about 20 minutes in the Pacific, right, Jeremy? About that. Yeah, I thought that was the 50-50 rule. You have a 50-50 chance of surviving 50 degree water for 50 minutes. Mm. I haven't heard that one. That's a sailor's term. Yeah. But the point is, your body core, if you don't keep it regulated, think about it. We're in the Pacific Northwest, cold and wet. If you're cold and wet, body temperature is going to start to drop. Your vital organs are going to start to shut down. Okay? So, in our climate and in any climate, we have to regulate our temperature. Warm and dry. Now, I used to live in Tucson, Arizona. The desert, right? 120 degrees or more. You go out in the desert, people think you die because you didn't have water. No! Your core temperature why not? There's no shade in the desert. The sun's beating down on you. So basically, your organs start to cook. Okay? The temperature rises. What happens if somebody gets a fever 105? They're not going to last long, right? So that's why this is the this is more important than water and food. Does everybody understand that? That's critical. Once again, I think it was Highway 38 about, I've been telling this story, I think now for three or four years, a couple guys went off road, hiking or hunting or something. All of a sudden, the temperature dropped. They didn't have anything to stay warm. They wound up. Yeah. yeah. See, that can be avoided. Okay. Now, three days, no water. What happens? Once again, your internal organs start to shut down because the body is made up of how much percentage of water? Anybody? Yeah, it, it varies, but it's at least 70% in an adult, okay? So we're mostly water. No water, it's going to be curtains in three days. <laughs> Food, about three weeks. Some of us maybe can last a little longer than others. But the thing is, even after a short period of time, if your body doesn't get nutrients, then your brain starts to misfire. Okay? You start to make bad decisions. You might, you might wind up making a bad decision it costs you your life. So, food, three weeks. Everybody here have at least um, a week's worth of food at home right now? Okay. How about a month? About two months. Okay. Remember to think about the greatest good for the greatest number. Yeah. Anybody hear those public service announcements on the radio about the tsunami and how you know you should have a go bag and that help might not get here for a couple of months, so you should have at least 14 days worth of food at home. 
Does anybody see something wrong with that? And just every time I hear it, I cringe. I mean, it's like you're telling me. Let me get this straight. You're telling me um, it might take months before services come back to anywhere near normal, but I only need two weeks of food. <laughs> okay. So finally. Uh, Tom Hanks, Wilson, everybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, three months, no social contact. They say people get crazy. A millennial, three seconds, no Facebook, no Instagram. <laughs> they are? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, I'm looking around the room. You all look like really nice people. We are. Yeah. Okay? But this is a toughie. Let's say you've got a 12 months supply of food and you live alone. Disaster happens. There's a knock on the door. It's your best buddy. Can you help me out? And you being a nice person say, sure. Now you've got a six months supply. There's a knock on the door. There's like one of your relatives and their spouse. Hey. Can you help us out? Your 12 month supply just now got cut down to three months. And there's a knock at the door. <laughs> a couple more of your neighbors. Hey, can you help us out? Your 12 month supply just got cut down to two. Do I need to go on? <laughs> Are you getting the picture? So, one of the things about um, being a prepper, they talk about something um, called operational security or OPSEC. It's kind of like keeping your business your business. You don't tell people about all your supplies. <laughs> okay? So people go, by Avery, you're out there every month telling people about being prepared. We know you're prepared. And people go, yeah, they're coming to your place. I go, no, don't you understand? The more people I educate, the less I'll have to shoot. <laughs> 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 but the thing is, we laugh, but this is something that is serious business. This is serious business because if you talk to your neighbor about preparing and they're not prepared, you're going to get that knock at the door. What are you prepared to do? Something you have to think about. Some people go, well, you know what? I'll put back extra food. <clears throat> Something to consider. Any questions on that? Don't answer the door. <laughs> exactly. You don't want to go to jail. Okay, so once again, you're on your own. Okay? So that's the end of the workshop. Any questions? You guys ready to watch a couple disaster videos? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Shoot. Do you have, are you going to tell us what you put in the bill bag and stuff like that? Or? Sure, we can do that. Okay, here we go. Fukushima. I saw this I keep saying that. Just watch the water go down the walls.
Flamingos, the Arab Flamingos. Okay. Did they have a warning on that? I'm in yeah. Amsterdam. <laughs> no. Not really. The warning was the ground shaking. Okay. When the local tsunami, your conversation. You feel oh. ground shaking. And you know the tsunami is going to be coming soon. In this area, somewhere between 8 and 15 minutes. You feel that ground shake after you drop cover and hold, you beat feet to high ground. I thought that tsunamis had a big wave. No, that's only in Hollywood. No, tsunamis, the, the water just keeps coming, and then just keeps coming. And just, it's not one of those big, you know, the rock. You know, it's not where like, the, no. it, the ocean goes out. The ocean, comes, the ocean goes out, but it comes back in, but it's not this big huge okay. wave. It just comes mm -hmm. in, it's just so much water, just keeps coming and coming. And as you saw in that video, that's reality. That's not Hollywood. Okay? The sneaker waves that we get here are a very good example. Mm -hmm. So, same thing. So that, I mean, and the thing about this, well, the reason I want to show the video is, you all know it can't happen here, right? Mm -hmm. It did in Crescent City. Right. But see, there's a lot of people who, they can't fathom it happening. You know, no, it's not going to happen. Well, they've been talking about this earthquake for years. It's not going to happen. Probably, do you, anybody know anybody like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And that's why they don't prepare. Because they don't want to think something that horrible could happen to the place they live. This is from pictures from 65. Yeah. Now, here's a video, a quick video, that tells you how to survive a earthquake or worse. Suddenly, a loud crash. A dish falls on the floor in your kitchen. Your dog barks and more things fall and smash. Your feet feel unsteady on the ground? What's happening? It's an earthquake and you need to act fast. If you don't, you could get injured, trapped, or worse. So, how do you survive an earthquake? Well, here's how to do it, according to science. Earthquakes can happen anywhere, at any time. The Earth's outer crust is made of tectonic plates floating on the planet's upper mantle. The edges of these plates, called fault lines, are where most earthquakes occur. When the plates butt up against each other and get stuck, that causes pressure to build up. Once the plates move again, that's when an earthquake happens. Most of the world's earthquakes happen in an area called the Ring of Fire. In fact, 80% of earthquakes happen in this area along the Pacific Ocean. The Ring of Fire includes countries in Asia like Japan, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Some of these countries have earthquakes as often as a few times per month. The damage that earthquakes can do includes everything from tearing up roads to fires, landslides, avalanches, and tsunamis. To be an earthquake survivor, it's best to start before an earthquake even happens. Get prepared beforehand. First, secure large items like TVs so that they're unlikely to fall. And store your heavy and breakable belongings on low shelves. Second, practice drop, cover, and hold on with your family. Drop to your hands and knees, cover your head with your arms, and hold on to heavy furniture until the earthquake stops. Third, make a family emergency plan for when you'll need if you're separated. Fourth, get yourself a supply box and fill it with water, food, and medication. Toss in a flashlight. Don't forget your phone charger and a whisker. Fifth, consider buying earthquake insurance for your home if you aren't already covered. Now for the main event. During an earthquake, do what you practiced. Drop, cover, and hold on. If you're in a car, pull over. If you're indoors, do not stand in a doorway. Once thought to be the safest place in an earthquake, a doorway is no stronger than any other part of a building. After an earthquake, stay alert. There will be aftershocks, which are much smaller tremors. If you're in a damaged building, get outside and move away from it. If you've been trapped in a falling building, try to stay calm. Cover your mouth to keep debris from getting into your airway. 
send a text if you can, bang on a pipe, or use a whistle to get the rescuer's attention. If you're near a large body of water, go inland and up to higher ground right after the major shaking has ceased. After an earthquake is when the tsunamis happen. Do not enter damaged buildings. If your radio, TV, or smartphone are still working, check for emergency information and instructions. If you want to help, then keep yourself safe while doing so. Do not try to lift heavy debris by yourself, and wear protective clothing when volunteering in a rescue or cleanup. Earthquakes are dangerous, but if you follow this advice, you have an excellent chance of walking away unscathed, according to science. Okay, that's how, now we can watch how to survive a tsunami. <laughs> Between your toes. You're on a beach, not a worry in the world. The sun bronzing your skin, sand trickling between your toes. The sound of waves. Wait, what? Where did all the water go? Did you see it going out? Better act quickly. In a matter of minutes, you may be underwater. Here's how to survive a tsunami, according to science. Tsunamis are triggered by intense underwater activity, usually an earthquake or an underwater volcanic eruption. These events displace huge volumes of water, pushing it up from the ocean's floor to its surface. But when gravity pulls it back down, all this built-up energy is released outwards, forming deadly waves that grow stronger as they ripple across the ocean. A tsunami's waves can be 100 kilometers long and sometimes taller than 30 meters. They can travel across whole oceans, moving at the speed of a jet airplane. So with such speed, strength, and stamina, how does anyone stand a chance? Even in a tsunami hazard zone, you can still survive if you know what to do. The first step to survival is to be able to identify the early signs of a tsunami. The Pacific Ocean is home to volatile tectonic activity, which explains why 75% of the world's volcanic eruptions and 90% of the world's earthquakes occur in the Pacific. These geological disturbances are the reason why 85% of all tsunamis happen in the Pacific Ocean. In most cases, an earthquake comes before a tsunami. So if you're near the coast and you experience an earthquake, Protect yourself from that first, but once the shaking stops, move to higher ground as quickly as possible. The beach will grow bigger. Run the other way. An early sign of an impending tsunami is that the water along the coast will recede. It pulls back and exposes the seafloor. Do not go to the beach to investigate. You'll only be putting yourself at risk for when the water surges back. Instead, head in the opposite direction. Try to get as far as three and a half kilometers from the ocean or 30 meters above sea level to ensure your safety. Get to the highest elevation possible. Tsunamis travel quickly and you may not have enough time to clear the hazard zone. In this case, look for a tall building with a sturdy concrete foundation. If you see one nearby, run inside and get to the roof as quickly as possible. If you can't make it to a building in time, your best bet is to grab onto something and hold on. Though that might not sound very practical, hold the eye roll for a moment. In the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, an Indonesian woman was finally rescued after holding onto a palm tree for five days straight. While it isn't ideal, if you can't get to higher ground in time, you need to find something to hold on to. As the tsunami moves inland, it will sweep tons of debris along with it. This can be very dangerous, as the accumulation of debris traveling at high speeds become fatal obstacles for anyone who's caught in the current. However, many tsunami victims have been saved by climbing on to detached roofs or holding on tightly to floating cars or other large objects. Of course, if you've made it this far, your troubles aren't over yet. A tsunami isn't one wave, but a series of waves known as a tsunami wave train. Waves may be anywhere from five minutes apart to an hour apart. And be aware that the first wave that hits isn't always the strongest. So even when you think it's over, stay where you're safe until you hear from local officials. 
It goes without saying. Tsunamis are terrifying. And when a 30 meter wave is hurtling towards you at 800 kilometers per hour, you're probably feeling pretty helpless. But have faith in science, trust empirical research, and you'll see there's always a way out. We'll keep showing you one episode at a time on According to Science. Anybody have any questions on that? Hey, are you tired of the media spinning the truth and pushing false narratives upon you? Well, take a look at this. The media is pushing the whole Trump colluding with Russia narrative. The Epic Times has been covering Spygate. Oh, yeah. What? Oh, that's too funny. So, any questions? On the tsunami levels of the signs, or how, how accurate are they? And are they based on the 9.0 earthquake, or...? Jeremy, you want to handle that one? <laughs> so I'll come up here to where I'm going to... Once again, this is Jeremy Grumeyer. He's the Curry County Emergency Manager. Good evening. So the question was the levels of the tsunami based on... The signs. Or the accurate... I would always say add a factor of 10. And I'm going to also give this caveat. Do you live in Oregon or California? Yeah, here in Brooklyn. Does anyone here live in Smith River or Crescent City? I'm going to tell you, study our maps and study your maps. There's a huge difference. Um, if you look at the expected or historical tsunami levels at, say, Winchuck River, you'll see the elevation is at 160 feet for a local 9.0, 9.2 earthquake and tsunami. 160 feet, which is just on the east side of 101, running up the hill. If you look at the Madison Smith River, 30 feet. Their maps have not been updated in a long time. They're just now getting to that. So I will tell you that there's great historical evidence. Like I have property up in Gold Beach, north of town, and I have tsunami sand deposits at 97 feet elevation, one mile in from the ocean. So, generically speaking, yes, the tsunami lines are accurate, but always as a factor of 10. Just go higher. Okay, and to add on to that, before the biggest or the most, there was one that was smaller. And then there was one that was smaller. Just think about like world records, right? Somebody could jump so high. Then all of a sudden somebody could jump higher, new world record, right? Well, it's the same with tsunamis. Japan, if I remember correctly, the biggest tsunami wave they had before Fukushima was 52 feet. They built the wall 55. The tsunami was 62. New world record, or new Fukushima record. So that being said, personally, he said 10 times, so if they say go to 100, go to at least 200, if not 300. Feet and elevation. Whatever, whatever the measurement is, double it or triple it, but at least double it, okay? Just to be safe because of that new world record phenomenon. Does everybody understand that? Better to be safe than sorry. Um, here, if you want the website, um, OregonGeology.org. Uh, it's or you could just Google um, Dogami D O G A M I, and you can get all the information, the current information they have about earthquakes and tsunamis, and they have the zones. In fact, um, they have the zone viewers and the inundation maps. There's one. You type in your address, and they'll show you exactly where. You are tell you all the different hazards: mudslide, earthquake, tsunami, etc. Any questions on that? Okay, since so somebody or a couple people have mentioned about packs, can we put the lights on? I will unpack my pack so you can see what I have in. I have a question first. Yeah, sure. Um, at least the last time when I was on the fire department is the last time I saw the maps of the tsunami zone. Mm -hmm. And my house isn't in the zone, but I'm right by the river. And on railroad at the very end, 
I mean, how accurate are those maps? It doesn't seem like I'm in a safe area. So you're on railroad. Railroad in Del Norte. Yeah. If you're on Del Norte, you right on are the right, you're right there on the edge. If you're on Del Norte, you're right on the edge of the local tsunami hazard zone. Distant tsunami, no. You're fine. Pardon? Distant tsunami, like say Alaska, Chaka, Japan, Chile, you're clear. But for a local event, if you're on that Del Norte <coughs> road line as you curl around towards memory, mm -hmm. yeah, there's very limited spots in Brookings that are, Brookings proper, that are in the tsunami inundation zone, the local one. Del Norte Lane is one of those that's just right on that edge. So the, the river's kind of act, kind of water funnels up those rivers oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My pack. Somebody usually always says, what's the most important thing to put in your pack? <laughs> Actually, there is a good answer to that. If you are on any life-sustaining medication, you need to have it. And I say, if you ever leave the house, you should always have a minimum of one week's supply. There's people who went to Portland, Came home 38, they got stuck in health for a few days. So let's just say they're planning on the weekend, they leave Friday, they're coming home on Sunday, and then they get stuck there and they don't have their life sustaining medication. What happens? Yeah, you don't know if that local pharmacy is going to be able to fill that prescription. So to me, that's the most important thing in your pack. Okay, remember the rule of three? Okay. I talked about <coughs> having something so I can breathe, right? You can get what's called an N95 mask or an N99 mask. If you don't have that, you can take a banana, uh, banana, no, bandana, <laughs> and if you look on the internet, there's like 33 things you can do with this, or 101 things you can do with a bandana, but you can keep smoke away. Okay, so there's your three minutes oxygen. Any questions? Okay, what was next? What was next? Is your quiz. Come on. Keep your body warm. Yeah, keep, keep your body warm. Okay, so. What I have is, in this waterproof container I got free at Lowe's, most of this stuff you see here I either got for free or at a thrift store, okay? With the one exception, I did buy this bag off of Wish.com for, I think, $7.99, $10.99. Yeah, they sell you these same bags for like 30 bucks, but if you go to Wish.com, no, I do not own stock in Wish. But in here, I've got matches and a lighter that I got free someplace, but I have, you know, a couple different ways to start a fire. Also, Vaseline and dryer lint. Right. Now, has any, anybody have a magnesium fire starter? Has anybody ever used a magnesium fire starter? <laughs> How long does it take you to start a fire with a magnesium fire starter? Three days. Whether you're an eight-year-old boy or not. Now, I want you to think of something. It's a disaster. If you're cold and wet, you, you want the pan to get warm and dry quickly. You don't want to be fooling around with a magnesium fire starter. That being said, what you do is you shave the magnesium off. You put it into like an old film canister or something. That way, when it comes time to make the fire, you've already done all that shaving part. All you got to do is maybe hit it a couple times with your striker. You got a fire. Common sense, right? But it's not too common. But it makes sense. So you have to think ahead that way. Okay. So warm and dry. Now. Oh, you're getting the head of things here. That's okay. Warm and dry. Okay, at Harbor Freight, 
you know, free with any purchase when they have them. A tarp, tent, cover, ground cover. You always see homeless people where they got cardboard on the ground. It's insulation because if you go straight on the ground, the ground will suck all the heat out of your body against what you want to do. Garbage bag. This can be ground cover, it can be shelter, it can be your rain poncho. You can carry things in it, but this can keep you warm and dry. Because if you think about it, your body's 98.6. You've got all the heat you need. What you have to do is insulate it from the environment. Because if you insulate it, like if you get one of those ponchos that doesn't have any ventilation, what do you do? Why? Well, it's hot. And then when it gets ready, you get cold. Right. Now, fortunately, we don't live in Eugene, so when we go to the store, <laughs> they put the things we buy in these plastic bags. You know what these can be used for? Shoes, feet, or keep your feet dry. Exactly. You take off your shoes, you slip these over your socks or your feet, and you put your shoes back on. Your feet are not going to stay dry. How much did this cost? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And somebody <laughs> asked about space blanket, which I got free at some preparedness expo seminar somewhere. They were giving them out. In fact, I got a whole bunch, and sometimes when I do prepper meetings, I give them out. But you can buy these for just a couple of bucks, but they help keep you warm and dry. Okay, of course, if you're going to string up your uh, tarp, you need some string, which you probably have laying around, or twine, just something. So, warm and dry. What came next? Water. Water. Remember I talked about that Sawyer water filter? Mm -hmm. I want it back, <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> but I passed it around so you guys can see. Now, with water, you might need something to boil the water in, because if you want to filter the water and then boil it, make sure if anything's bad, it ain't going to kill you. Now, think about boiling water to purify it. Once it has the rolling boil, that's it. Just let it cool down and save the drink. Because if you let it boil for five or ten minutes, you're just wasting it. Nothing's going to live at 212. It's going to be dead at 160. Okay? So contrary to what people have taught you in the past, you don't need to keep boiling the water forever. Now, somebody said this was the most important thing. When stuff hits the fan, you want to clean the stuff, right? But... I say that jokingly, but when you need it, you need it, right? And you don't want to be fooling around with something other than that during a disaster. Because one of the things that happens is, in some disasters, there's no longer sanitation. There's no longer working toilets. You know, you don't want disease. You don't want bacteria. So comes in handy. So we talked about water, right? What comes next? Okay. Mountain House rice and chicken. Got some jerky. Bars. Got some peanut butter crackers. I've got some other uh, breakfast bars. Anybody know why I have it in a metal tin? Mm -hmm. Safe from what? Moisture. Yeah, well, actually, I don't know about safe from moisture. Maybe if I duct tape it, it might be safe from moisture. If I put it in a plastic bag, it'd be safe from moisture. But not just bugs, but other critters like rats and mice, anything else that might be hungry out there. Okay, so we talked about food, water, and there's other things. Now, 
in a disaster, there's lots of things that can get you. And I prefer to prevent rather than have to use my first aid training. So, in a disaster, you want to protect your eyes, you want to protect your hands. Okay? Because you don't know what you're going to be crawling through. You don't want to get puncture wounds. They're the worst kind. You, know, you don't even want to get a splinter because it could get infected. We're talking about disaster. Minimal resources, right? So it just makes sense to me to protect things that are vulnerable like your eyes and your hands. Now, also with the water, you're going to need something to carry it in. <coughs> I've got, I think I got that at the first stage too. Um, for heat, I also have a candle. Now, I have a few different flashlights in here, but the thing is, to me, the reason you have a flashlight is because you're in a building and the lights went out and you need to see to get out. I mean, if it's a disaster, I'm going to wake up with the sun, I'm going to go to bed with the sun. I don't really need to be wandering around with the lights, okay? In fact, I think I got this Harvard freight free with any purchase. This is my, or one of my first aid kits. This is the other one. Very, very, very minimal. Now, the thing about your pack, this is mine. This is for me. You have to figure out what you want. Some people have very elaborate first aid kits. They call them individual first aid kits or IFACs. You can spend 50 bucks or more on them. But, you know, I've got a few Band-Aids, you know, a few sanitation wipes and things like that, but I would rather prevent the injury than have to fix it. Um, creature comfort, toothpaste, toothbrush. I got this at the, uh, I think the Curry County Emergency Fair a year ago. Um, I talked about food, a couple cans of tuna fish that are in water. Anybody know why I should probably have one in oil? For calories? Hmm? For calories? That's one reason. Any other one? The oil lights. Yeah, exactly. What? You, the oil burns. Yeah. So, like, I've got this glow stick, I think I got this at an emergency preparedness. Now, you notice I don't have one of those Rambozo knives. <laughs> I have this. It's a pry bar. Once again, in our natural type disasters, you don't see a bunch of people running around using knives. Right? But you might need to dig or to pry something loose or to pry something off of somebody. Um, this can also be a weapon. So, multi-use, and it's only like three or four bucks. It's not that heavy. But the thing is, you have to think practical. And once again, everything I show you here, this is my opinion. You know, you have to figure out what works for you. Okay? Because, you know, Jeremy has a bag. He's got a big bag. I think he just bought a small one tonight. But each person is going to have different needs. Okay? So you have to figure out what your needs are. I'm kind of like giving you a, a template. So, for example, here I've got another little flashlight and a little multi-tool, which may or may not come in handy. I never leave home without this one. Okay, in prepping, we have a saying, one is none, because if it loses or break, how many do you have? None. So if you have two, you got one, and if you have three, you got two. Um, <laughs> I don't see what else. That seems like a minimal amount of food. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, this is my get home bag. Okay. Home from here is about 75, 80 miles. I think I got enough to last me a couple of days. It takes me three days to get home. Okay. You know, you know, I might be a little hungry when I get there, but I think I've got <laughs> I've got enough to sustain. I got this little emergency drinking water pack. I, to me, this see what the title of this is um, reality prepping. This is a joke. Okay, I mean, is it better than nothing? Yeah, but I mean, really. This is not really going to sustain life for any length of time. Could you take your pill? Yeah, you can take your <laughs> pill. Um, I've got some bootstraps here in case I break a shoelace, or you can use that to tie things down. I got some tent stakes. I picked up at Goodwill for a buck. Um, Wendy supplied me with a nice uh, and a fork and a spoon. Got a couple of three by five cards if I need to write note, a sharpie, a pen, a couple of pencils. Oh, let's see. Is there anything else I missed here? Um, oh yeah, here's another little flashlight. This is a solar powered one, so it can charge. And somebody mentioned a whistle. If you need help, three. Then wait, because if you say, help, help, you're going to kill your voice. It's not going to last. But, you know, and take it. Everybody understand that? And I picked this up free at the Get Ready Coos Bay, Coos Bay Fire Department. So I, I keep saying that because you can find stuff if you know what to look for, and it might not cost you anything. You go to these different fairs. Um, Do you have a paracord something over there? Is that like a bracelet? Oh, yeah, this. Um, a buddy of mine made this and he gave it to me, so I just stuck it on here. Paracord. But this, once again, to me, gets into the Rambozo territory. <laughs> because all you have to do is watch the news and you see what happens. I mean, in Hurricane Maria, you know, the hurricane just came to level some of these places. Blue roofs off. Well, you see people out there, they put their tarps up, and what's remaining of their house, they're, they're back in it. it. They're not out there, you know, in, in the jungle. No, they're, they're back trying to, you know, recover what they have. And they're going to make do. So, that's why I say, a lot of that stuff, it, if you're going out in the woods, yes. But there's a couple of things. Number one, if you go out in the woods and you have a compass and you get lost, you're an idiot. Think about it. You have a compass. What should you be doing as you walk into the woods, especially if you're not familiar with them? Well, kind of, sort of. <laughs> Seriously, what should you be doing if you're going to unfamiliar woods and you have a compass? See what you're walking on. See which way you're walking. Right? In other words, you take waypoints. Okay? So you go so far, that's like, okay, that way you can find your way back. Because if you have a compass and you're lost, you're an idiot. Okay? The other thing is if you go up by yourself, some people like to do things like that, but you're putting yourself at risk. I mean, that's, you can make better choices. Especially if there's no cell service. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you can't count on that. Yeah. So, that's pretty much my pack. Oh, this was more brown cover. I found this at the thrift store for like a buck. Um, so, does anybody have any questions about the pack? What do I need that for? Okay. Avery, what did he ask? He wanted to know where's my hand crank radio. I've got one at home, but if I'm not at home, I'm just going to try and get home. Okay. I'm not going to be concerned with, with what's coming over the radio. But that's my opinion. If you want to have a hand crank radio, I'm not going to tell you not to. I just, for me, I just don't need it. Next question. <coughs>
How much does that bag when it's fully packed? Well, I'll let you try it out after I put it back together. Next question. Do you have anything to heat water with? Put the water in here. And then what do you use for the heat pot? Oh, build a fire like cowboys did. Uh, like I said, I've got some uh, dryer lint and Vaseline, but no, I don't... <laughs> you know, once again, preparedness industry. I fell sucker to it before I did my analyzation. You know, analyzed all these things. I've got all these different types of stoves. I know how to make them out of, can, you know, coffee cans and soup cans. But all you need is a fire. You know, a couple rocks, sticks, or whatever. You got to make a fire. You don't have to have anything. You don't have to spend fifty dollars or a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars on all those stoves. You don't need it. At home, I've got grills, propane and charcoal. I've got a wood stove. I mean, I, I don't need all that extra gear. I can use that money for something I don't have, like if I didn't have a water filter. So like I said, you probably have most of what you need in your home. You just have to organize it and pick up a water filter. Everybody see this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes. I have a question about the water. Um, so if you do the water filter, how you don't have to boil it, right? Here's or what I do. do. I filter, then I boil. Okay. And so, and not just filter this way. Let's say you're at a creek. You can take a, a t-shirt, a bandana. You put that, you filter the water through that so it gets out all the big stuff. It's going to get out all the little stuff. This filter is out 99.98% of all the bad stuff. Okay. Then you boil it, just to be safe. So then on to having a good water supply at home for kind of the long term, for <coughs> several weeks maybe, if the big one yet. I hate bottled water. I just think it's an environmental disaster. Mm -hmm. I don't use it. I have very a few in my house for guests occasionally. I, I don't like it. What am I supposed to do? I mean, you okay. need lots of water and then you have to rotate it. Well, um, why do you say you have to rotate it? It's H2O. Just shake it. Okay. Okay. Here's the thing. You can get five gallon, those blue five or six gallon water cans. Fill them up. You can buy 55 gallon food grade buckets. You can get those 250 gallon square type containers. Or you can get the 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 big water tanks. It's up to you. And you could fill it with water, and that water would stay? Yeah. I mean, the only thing that happens with water is if, um, I'll get to you in a second, Jeremy. If it's sitting there, it tastes flat. You just have to take two clean containers, go back and forth to re-aerate the water. Jeremy. The other option too is you have your water heater. You got 55 gallons of water stored in that water heater, and it's drinkable. And you've got the back of your toilet. Okay, um, I stock distilled water, which you can buy for like 99 cents a gallon or something like that. Mm -hmm. My rationale is is that even something that is supposedly purified may in fact may have some bacteria of some sort in it that isn't any consequence if you drink it within 30 days. Mm -hmm. If it's been stored for two years, however, it's possible something's growing in it. Right. If I'm buying distilled water, then I figure that I'm going to have plastic leaching into the water, but that would be worst case scenario. Right. Okay, we got like one minute. So if you like drink juice from the store, you know the apple juice containers, you can rinse those out, wash them out, and refill them with water, recap them. If you want to put two or three tea, um, drops of Clorox in it just to kill anything that you might yeah. put in, you can do that too. The unscented Clorox. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? In an earthquake in the house. Where do you go? If you don't go to a doorway, um, where do they tell you to go? You want to take that one, Jeremy? <coughs> sure. 
So earthquake in your house. Nice thing about houses here in Curry County, by and large, is the wood frame structures. Generally speaking, in an earthquake, wood frame structures survive. Generally speaking. There will be some distortion, might cause foundation, but a wood frame structure usually survives the earthquake. So where are you going to go? Drop cover and hold underneath of some sort of object. If you've got a kitchen table, um, desk, some of that nature, get underneath it, hang on for the shaking. Three, four, five minutes of shaking. If you are working in county government and you are in the basement of the courthouse or the annex or any of these great old buildings that are not reinforced, unreinforced masonry buildings, my advice is to evacuate, evacuate, evacuate immediately. As safely as you can do so, get out of that building. But in your home, generally speaking, wood frame structure, drop cover, hold on, and then Evaluate if you're in the strong zone. After you clear the birthday, right? Yeah. Okay. As soon as it's safe to do so. Okay. Thank you for showing up. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming. The ladies are passing out a, a survey. If you have just a minute to rate the program so we get just a little bit of feedback. And for those of you that didn't get the handouts when you came in, we've got a few more printed up. So thank you so much.